When it comes to the 2000 Sydney Olympics and the game of basketball, there's really only one thing that people remember Vince Carter's iconic dunk of death over France's 7 2 Frederick Weiss. Although Team USA had always been expected to take home the gold and do so in style, no one, not even Carter himself, ever expected to see something like a 6'6 shooting guard jump over a 7'2 center during a game. Understandably, the play is widely considered one of the greatest moments in the history of the Olympics and arguably the greatest in the game of international basketball. But the dunk wasn't the only noteworthy moment at the games involving Carter. The games took place from mid to late September 2000. At the time, Carter had recently taken home the trophy for that year's NBA All-Star Weekend dunk contest in February which, along with his phenomenal in-game highlight reel, made him one of the most popular players in the NBA. So, while he wasn't necessarily the best player on Team USA's roster, he was the most intriguing and the one person that basketball fans, regardless of which team they supported, wanted to see. That is, until shortly after Team USA touched down in Australia and took on the host nation's team, the Boomers, in what was supposed to be a friendly exhibition game just days before the Olympics officially began that was anything but friendly. Predictably, the USA won the match, but the result is far from what anyone who actually saw it remembers. Rather, the game's famous for how it resulted in Carter, at least for the duration of the Olympics, becoming one of the most hated men in Australia. On paper, the idea of having a friendly exhibition match between Australia and the most star-studded squad in the Olympics seemed like a win-win situation. It would have let the Boomers test their skills against the best of the best, in addition to allowing them to determine what, if any, weaknesses a US team had that they could exploit later during the games. For the US, the match would serve as an introduction to the Olympics for the newcomers and familiarize them with the international rules of basketball which, in some cases, differed dramatically from those in the NBA. Additionally, the match would give the US a sense of just how good the competition would be because, although they were still well and truly favorites to dominate the games, America's competition in 2000 was much better than what the Dream Team had faced eight years earlier in Barcelona and what Dream Team 2 had faced in Atlanta in 1996. Also, Team USA, who had consciously avoided naming themselves Dream Team 3, weren't as strong as the previous two teams that had been made up of NBA players. For the Sydney Games, Team USA was made up of a number of future Hall of Famers, though most of them were still relatively young and still developing at the time. The squad included Sharif Abdul-Rahim, Ray Allen, Vin Baker, Vince Carter, Kevin Garnett, Tim Hardaway, Alan Houston, Jason Kidd, Antonio McDice, Alonzo Mourning, Gary Payton, and Steve Smith. Payton was the only member of the squad with Olympic experience, having been part of Dream Team 2 in 1996. The team was notable for the absence of some big names it had, at one point in time, committed to the team only to withdraw from the squad before it was finalized including Kobe Bryant, Tim Duncan and Shaq. The team was still impressive, but it was also objectively the weakest roster Team USA had fielded since NBA players were allowed to represent America in the Olympics. As for the Australian squad, it was one of the strongest the country had ever put together, but it still paled in comparison to the US team. The only player that American basketball fans would have recognized was Luke Longley, after he stint as the starting center with the history-making Bulls in their three-peat between 1996 and 1998. As for the rest of the team, it was made up of players largely unknown outside of Australia. Some had previously played, if only briefly, in the NBA, but only the biggest of basketball nerds would recognize names like Chris Anstey, Mark Bradkey, and Ricky Grace. There were two other players of note on the team, Andrew Gaze and Shane Heal. Despite going unselected in the 1989 draft, Gaze had previously played in the NBA multiple times, including with the Bullets in 1994 and the Spurs in 1999. Additionally, he was an NBA champion as he was a member of the Spurs' first championship team, though he contributed little to the victory. Gaze had, however, made a significant contribution to the Australian National Basketball League, the NBL, as he was a two-time champion and a seven-time league MVP. Despite making little impact internationally, Gaze was one of the best basketball players Australia had ever produced, and he was considered a national icon. Hill was also overlooked for selection when he nominated for the 1992 draft, but he did play in the NBA on multiple occasions. At the time, Hill had represented the Timberwolves during the 96-97 season. Years later, he'd also played for the Spurs. Like Gaze, Hill was also a national icon. 
and it would be the country's reverence for the two players that would lead to Carter becoming a villain in the eyes of Australian basketball fans. Been a bit more disappointed in his attitude than his game. The 2000 Olympics marked the first time an American team made up of NBA players had come to Australia. So, ahead of the exhibition game, the mostly Australian crowd were excited to see the stars up close, with high expectations that the team would put on a show. The crowd were especially excited to see Carter, given his already impressive highlight reel. But it wasn't long into the game that it became clear that this friendly match was going to be anything but that. The animosity began with Gaze and Carter when Carter was guarding the Australian, and the two got into a tussle after Carter blocked Gaze's path. Strange scenarios. Now, if you watch in the left-hand side of your screen, as Carter tried to fight through his screen already, there's some problems there as the two of them banging each other. And it was the next play when things got volatile. After making a three-point attempt, Carter and Gaze got entangled, which quickly led to both teams confronting one another. Intentional or unintentional, that started a series of yapping between a number of players. While well, some players, including Kidd, Garnett, and Morning, tried to de-escalate the situation, when Heal and Peyton got involved, things looked like they might get ugly. And for good reason, because this wasn't the first exhibition game between Australia and the US that had gone sour. Shortly before the 1996 Olympics in July that year, the two teams matched up against one another in a friendly game. Predictably, the US won the match, 118-77, to but it wasn't as easy as they'd expected, thanks to Heal. Ultimately, he finished the match with 28 points after shooting 8 for 13 from three-point range, many of which were far beyond the actual three-point line. Look where that NBA line is, and he is a step beyond. Still, despite Hill's impressive play, that's not what anyone ever remembers about the match. Rather, it was his confrontation with Charles Barkley who took exception to Hill's performance and made a dirty and dangerous play after Hill found himself open on the wing and attempted his fourth three-pointer. Andrew Gaze finds Bratke, and here's Heal for another three, and he hits on. Remarkably, despite standing at just six feet tall, Heal confronted Barkley, leading players from both sides getting involved. Jane Heal at midcourt have yeah. to be separated by the official, and Carl Malone in the middle right now. Well, this is totally uncalled for. The teams were separated, but that did little to resolve the situation. Later during the game, as the teams went to their respective huddles, Barkley mimicked shooting Heal. Additionally, as a point guard, he was matched up against Peyton, one of the greatest trash talkers of all time, who, after the two teams' confrontation, upped his mind games. After the match, Barkley congratulated Hill on his performance, and he would later admit that the play was dirty and completely uncalled for. As for Peyton, his and Hill's feud was far from over. Later, during the actual Olympics, the Boomers met the U.S. once again in the semifinals to determine which team would progress to play for the gold medal. From the start of the match, Peyton was back in Hill's face, though on this occasion, Hill responded with some trash talk of his own. At the time, Peyton had recently signed an $89 million contract with Seattle, which Hill used as ammunition. Ultimately, predictably, America won the match emphatically. After the game, Barkley praised Australia's effort, singling out Hill for respect. Later in September 1996, Hill did indeed join the NBA, signing with the Timberwolves, which Peyton used as an opportunity to again trash talk the Australian as he expressed delight at the thought of playing against him before savaging Australian basketball in general. But when Peyton finally came up against Hill in the NBA, it didn't quite go as the future Hall of Famer had expected. At one point during the game, Hill was at the free throw line, which is when Payton resumed his trash talking, telling his teammates that he'd take care of Hill. Hill then proceeded to make Timberwolves history. Back to Hill, another three. Ah! Oh, Shane! Oh, oh, Shane! Come back, Shane! Just up, makes out to Hill. Oh, he threw it down! He threw it down! Are you healed? Are you healed? Pray the Lord, I'm healed. In all. Shane Heal hit five three-pointers in the fourth quarter, setting a Minnesota Timberwolf team record. After the game, Peyton actually showed Hill some respect, congratulating him on the phenomenal performance. Now, during the 2000 exhibition game, it appears as though Heal and Peyton's feud had reignited. Fortunately, both sides managed to calm things down as they both went to their respective huddles. 
The capacity crowd of 15,000 were booing the Americans, with special attention directed at Carter, but that appeared to be the end of it. A potentially violent confrontation between Heal and Peyton had been avoided, and both teams appeared willing to put their differences aside and get on with the game. Rather, as fate would have it, things would only get worse for Carter. Ultimately, Team USA would win the exhibition game emphatically 89-86, though the match overall was much closer and tougher than the final margin would suggest, even after the two teams involved had ostensibly put their differences aside. Shortly after the confrontation between the teams occurred, Carter ran into the Australian referee Bill Mildenhall, dislocating the official's shoulder. And the official falls down and looks like he really hurt his wow, left elbow. He looks like he dislocated his shoulder. Well, he is in pain. It's either his elbow or his shoulder. Wow, look at his shoulder there, Mike. That looks that looks bad. Carter. Now this was inadvertent as he turned around to run up the floor. He tried to reach back and grab himself to brace his fall. Mildenhall had previously played Australian football Aussie rules between 1974 and 1979, and the collision with Carter aggravated an old injury. Still, Carter's ostensible indifference to the referee situation only served to further enrage the patriotic crowd, even though they were, for possibly the first and only time in the history of Australian sport, defending the honor of an umpire. Who the f is for the remainder of the match, the vast majority of the 15,000 fans would boo and heckle Carter every time he got the ball. Although Carter didn't play great, the harassment never really threw him off his game, but there was one moment that got to him, not because it rattled him, rather it was just confusing for the American. Traditionally, Australian sports fans are quite vocal and, when it comes to chants, there are two that are classics. There's a uniquely patriotic one commonly associated with international competitions such as the Olympics and the Commonwealth Games. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie! Aye, aye, aye! Then there's the other chant. So Hadley now copying just a little bit of a surf from the crowd here. And as the US-Australia exhibition game went on and it became clear that simply booing Carter wouldn't get to him, the crowd resorted to the second chant. He is being called the second coming of Michael Jordan. Having grown up in America in the 80s and 90s, Carter was clearly unfamiliar with the word wanker, though the context made it obvious that it wasn't a compliment. It was only after the match, during the post-game press conference, when it was explained to Carter exactly what the word meant. Figuratively, it's the equivalent of calling someone either an idiot, an a-hole, or a loser. Bus wankers! In a literal sense, it's slang for self-gratification. Arguably, the best ever use of the word was in the fourth episode of the fifth season of the TV series Community, entitled Cooperative Polygraphy, which first aired in January 2014. In the installment, the character Pierce is killed off after the actor who played him, Chevy Chase, had a falling out with the show's creator and showrunner, Dan Harmon. In the installment, after Pierce dies off screen, he leaves his former classmates with samples of his DNA. To you, I leave this bottle of fine scotch so that you're less tempted to drink this cylinder of even finer sperm. The cause of Pierce's death isn't revealed until the end of the episode, which, in arguably the most brilliantly vindictively meta way to kill off a disgruntled actor, it turns out that Pierce died as a result of dehydration while collecting the samples. So, basically, Pierce, like Chase's acting career in real life, died as a result of being both a literal and figurative massive wanker. I mean, it's how I want to go, but hey, I'm a little nutty. And back in 2000, having 15,000 people chanting that insult directly at him might actually have bothered Carter, if only at the time he understood the meaning behind it. As interesting as it would have been to see Team USA and Australia match up in the actual Olympics, where the stakes really matter, the teams never met in the tournament. Rather, the teams were allocated into different groups in the preliminary rounds before America easily won the gold medal match while Australia reached the bronze medal game but lost to Lithuania. Despite missing out on a medal, Gaze did top Carter in one aspect as he led all competitors in points, averaging nearly 20 points a game. Hill was second in scoring, with nearly 15 points, while Carter was third, with just under 15 a game. In a strange twist of fate, things turned out well for Mildenhall despite his injury during the exhibition game. Heading into the friendly, Mildenhall had been excited to oversee a game involving NBA players, so he was understandably devastated when he missed out on the rare opportunity. However, Carter later inadvertently made up for it when Mildenhall officiated the match against the USA and France, during which the ref got to witness firsthand Carter's iconic dunk over Weiss. Oh! 
Years after the Sydney Olympics, in August 2019, Gaze spoke about the controversial exhibition game, specifically his role in the volatility. Gaze is known by Australians for three things, being one of the best basketball players the country has ever produced, having had grey hair since his early 20s, and for being one of the nicest guys in basketball, which, in addition to national pride, is why the Australian crowd assumed that Carter was the villain in relation to Gaze and Carter's various heated moments during the exhibition game. But, upon reflection, Gaze admitted that his play was dirty and expressed regret while distancing himself from the crowd's infamous chant. Gaze also revealed that the seeds of the confrontation were sowed the day before the game when the Americans spurned any gestures of goodwill from their hosts. The Boomers were finishing up a practice session while the USA team were coming in when the two groups passed in the hallway. While Gay said that the Australians attempted to exchange pleasantries, the Americans largely ignored them. Members of Team USA later explained that the tense moments in the hallway were mostly due to the fact that they were annoyed by what was perceived as disrespect from the Australian media who had repeatedly underscored how the 2000 team paled in comparison to previous USA teams made up of NBA players. Then there was also Heal and Peyton's pre-existing feud, which summed up how Australia prepared for the match and how they regarded Team USA as Heal and the Boomers approached the game with respect for their opponents but not fear, especially when it came to NBA players. Since NBA players took the court in Barcelona, Spain back in 1992, international basketball has never been the same. The inclusion of NBA stars in the Olympics has grown the game of basketball around the world and produced some of the most memorable moments in Olympic history. But it's also resulted in some not-so-great moments, a number of which have involved the Australian team. After Heal and Barkley's confrontation back in 1996, followed soon after by Heal's feud with Peyton, the 2000 exhibition game was always going to be heated. Still, the contest went from friendly to volatile much quicker than anyone had expected. Even stranger was the fact that Carter, of all people, became the target of scorn. The game was supposed to be a friendly match during which the host nation would try their best, maybe make a couple of unexpected great plays, then emphatically lose to the teammate of a superstars. Instead, fans watched as an inferior team made up of passionate players got under the skin of a team made up of some of the greatest players in the world. From the perspective of the Australians, there was a general belief amongst the team that the US maybe weren't taking the game seriously, which gave the Australians extra motivation. For the Americans, the team was understandably bothered by the lack of respect from the media of the host nation. After the game, Morning was vocal about Team USA's victory, gloating that the Australians had woken a sleeping dog with their disrespect, even though the Americans were always well and truly favourites. Ultimately, the Boomers took Team USA's disdain as a backhanded compliment given that the Americans had no real reason to fear Australia's team yet made it clear from the start that they were all business. So, with a combination of dismissive media reports, the awkward interaction in the hallway, and the previous confrontations before and during the 1996 Olympics, the ostensibly light-hearted exhibition game between Australia and Team USA was never going to be friendly. Unfortunately for Carter, he just happened to get caught up in the middle of the hostilities, becoming the target of a 15,000 strong, fiercely patriotic crowd. Carter sitting on the bench there, sitting off the bench, it just hasn't been a great night for him. And he's, I'm disappointed, I wanted to see him really fly. You know? I mean, it's how I want to go, but hey, I'm a little nutty.